But so uh, what this what this refers to is uh, you do have districts, many districts in the state, at least if I know so many, that are declining in enrollment. And most of these are smaller districts. So you take a place like Parrish in Colorado, which is out by Rifle, and they're a big oil and gas community. So they have a big uh, uh, gas exploration that comes three years ago. And overnight they go from 200 students to 500 students. And then after two years, that closes down. You know, and they go from 500 to 400, or 400 to 300. And you drop 25% of your entire budget in one year. Uh, and so what the state has done is for those districts that are seeing declining in enrollment, it allows you to average your losses over up to five years as a way to soften that curve to make it easier to adjust for things like if you go from 19 kids in a class to 17 kids in a class or 16, you can't cut the kindergarten teacher. Right? Um, there are some fixed costs that are harder to work around. What we do on that increasing side is we do make it possible for districts to realize increasing enrollment. So if you have growth over the course of the year, then you can, you can capture that increased funding by a true up in the middle of the year. Um, but we did preserve this cost on, um, on declining enrollment districts because it so dramatically impacts uh, the smallest districts in the state that are hit that way. And it is not, I think there was always a sense that there was some big gold line of money to be found if we just eliminated that entirely. And because all the districts are small, it's a small number. It's around $20 million or so a year that's spent on declining enrollment. So it's not nothing, but it's not enough that it's gonna you know, it's going to save any of the rest of the state by putting those places in very significant hardship. And so we have preserved uh, that function in the same way that a lot of folks have advocated that there should be no size factor at all. There shouldn't be an increased expenditure for districts that are 100 students versus those who are uh, 50,000. Um, and we kept that because the data to us suggests and the conversations with leaders around the state suggest that uh, there really are added diseconomies at scale for running a district of 200 kids that aren't present with running one of 20,000. And so those two things, both the size factor incentive or support for small districts and the declining enrollment will be kept in place to help those districts that are being hurt the most by funding. And they still, they're still going to lose that money if the trends continue, but it helps protect you against wild fluctuations one year over year. There is a way to so there is a way to fund it. Uh, so you could fund it through sales tax. Um, it's just a different uh, it's a different structure to go about. Sales tax tends to be a more regressive tax because everybody pays the same 2.9 percent. So if you make a million dollars a year or you make ten thousand dollars a year, you go to the store and buy a bread, you pay the same 2.9 percent. So sales tax is a much larger percentage of income out of the lowest income earners. Um, and so there was not a lot of support for that. I will also say. Uh, there are other needs in the state beyond just education. I think education is our top priority. It's not our only priority. There is still a lot of discussion about how to do um, um, expansion of some of the transportation needs across the state. And uh, they have looked at their, their modeling has been all sales tax modeling because they think it's more of an accurate representation of who uses the transportation system than people who use the education system. If you just come through town and buy stuff and use our light rail, um, it's a better place to capture. So we have modeled it, but we haven't planned to use it. Does that answer your question? It depends on which one of the ballot titles are chosen, uh, but they range, the most of them are in the range of around $900 million a year. So it's around 900 to $950 million. Um, and someone asked earlier, what's the average taxpayer impact? It will depend on which of the ballot measures is selected. But the, for most of them, the, the median taxpayer, the average taxpayer impact is somewhere around $250 a year. And again, there are others that, there are some versions that are much higher, uh, like 400, 450. So those are not ballot titles that I'm hoping we select. And so there are two ways. One is, the new dollars uh, we have under all the ballot titles go into a separate fund, which is called the State Education Achievement Fund. So there's direct accounting for every one of the new dollars as to which investment they go to and how much we spend there. So we did that just for the purpose of the ROI study to make sure you don't commingle it with the rest of the five billion. Um, and so that allows us to very clearly track those. And then we have some RFPs that will go out for modeling of programs that will get us the, those ROIs. Because one of the 
you, you, you care about this, you're obviously you're probably two steps ahead of me on thinking about it. One of the things we want to model are what are the different returns you want to measure? You know, so do you, you want student achievement? For sure. Do you want attendance? Do you want parent and student satisfaction? Do you want uh, college and career readiness? Do you want job placement afterwards? We're trying to, we're, we do some work with some independent auditors who would do what those metrics are. But the financial key is separate account, untouchable, all you need for the new dollars. Great question. This is uh, marijuana. Is the other. One. This is the. This is, this is our favorite pop parlor game. And the <laughs> school fu funding community is: Does marijuana on the ballot help you or hurt you? Um, lots of funny jokes about who might be driven to the polls and why they might be driven to the polls. Um, so the, so I, I joke a little. But the one other major statewide ballot we're envisioning is there was a referred measure from the legislature on the tax structure for marijuana. So if you remember, Amendment 64 passed, and it said marijuana shall be legalized and there shall be a system to tax it. Right? That, that was always the grand bargain. It's, hey, why don't we make marijuana legal? Then we can tax it, and we can make all this revenue to help support safety and intervention and structures. Well, the way they did it was they had the tax run separate from the legalization. So it's already been legalized. Now we have to come back and pass the tax, which is a separate structure. So there will be a, a marijuana initiative on the ballot, and it will be just for the tax on, on marijuana. It, it polls very, it polls like 70%. So it looks like people who opposed marijuana in the first place now want to make sure and tax the snot out of it afterwards. <laughs> and folks who liked it the first time uh, are probably willing to vote for taxes. They don't want to, you know, to lose it down the road. So I think that will pass. There is some um, agreement to fund uh, the capital construction for schools on that ballot. So it has a small correlation to education, but it will do nothing for operations, for all the things we described, nothing for, uh, you know, for kindergarten, for ECE, for student needs, for implementation for assessments, all that stuff. So uh, I would say my biggest concern is that people will get confused that somehow the marijuana initiative is an education initiative when it's not. Uh, and it's not gonna get us anywhere near the needs and all it does is construction. And the hard part is, this is where it gets funny, so for the CFOs in the room, the purpose of this structure is they, they put it into capital construction, but as you know, the way you build schools is you, you issue a 30-year bond on a school. And so you're asking a bank which, by the way, right now won't take any deposits from the marijuana industry. You're asking a bank to issue a 30-year bond on their projection of recreational marijuana use over the next 30 years. I don't know a bank in the state that's going to do that. Right? So the dollars they're supposed to be giving us is going to come in a structure that makes it almost impossible to use it for the, for the use that's designed, which is long-term capital construction. So we hope it passes, and we hope there are some dollars to help us. That's the major item on the ballot, and it won't. I mean, the great of passes, but it, it, people should never see it as either or that there are two education issues because one's really an education issue, one's a marijuana issue. Uh, we have had some local districts who've said, hey, we were thinking about putting a local ballot on, we've been waiting to run a bill, and we were going to do it this year, but we think we're going to wait because of the statewide ballot. To any extent that the people are making that decision, I think that's helpful. I think it's hard to go uh, with two questions on the same ballot. Um, and I think there were a lot of ballots that passed last year, a lot of overrides and bonds that passed last year, so I think there'll be fewer this year, but I think the big one will be the statewide ballot. That's also, by the way, to your question, sir, why it helps us to go in 2013 instead of 2014. Um, the cost for, you know, in, in an election year, the governor's race, U.S. Senate race, presidential race, those years, the cost of buying a newspaper ad or a TV ad or a radio ad go up 50 to 100%. So what you have to raise $7 million to do this ballot this year, you have to raise $12 million. So the fact that there's a relatively open ballot makes it easier for us to get our message out. Uh, kindergarten and early childhood separate. Kindergarten will be now a full day funding to districts for kindergarten students and to charters. Um, right now, the state literally uh, calls a kindergartner uh, one half of a person. Um, I have two of them, so I can, I can identify with that sometimes. Uh, but, uh, but right now, what we just say is that now you actually, they, they, we call them a full person, and you fund them as a full student. So that's, that's just a clean change to the district formula and the charters. But the early childhood is a very different structure, because you're right. What we have right now is we have a very strong market of early childhood providers across the state, some nonprofit, some for-profit, um, and many people are very excited about the quality of work that is being done. 
And so uh, this doesn't change that structure. What it will do is it will fully fund all of the slots in the Colorado Preschool Program. So every student who is eligible for Colorado Preschool Program. So we're identifying those students with the most significant uh, risks of being behind in kindergarten. And we would fund all the students on that wait list. Um, then we'll do two things. One is we'll imagine that in most of the places that have strong private markets or good nonprofit providers, parents are going to continue to access those and go there, and they will, and we'll make that possible. Um, in places where districts want to offer more ECE but don't have the physical space, there is some dollars that we would also put up dollars that would be available for some of these facilities and operations costs that could be transitioned to uh, services uh, build out for those schools. So if you don't have any space, you have to go from half day K to full day K, because you have two, you have a morning half day and an afternoon half day, you can't do two full classes. We provided some resources for that. But what we found is, it's not totally true, but it turns out pretty well, that in most of the places that have um, a real shortage of physical space in the district, they also have a pretty robust market of nonprofit providers in that same space. So we're imagining there's, you're not going to see a big change there. You're going to take more and more of the nonprofit providers will fill those slots. And some of those smaller rural districts where they don't have a lot of other nonprofit providers that are in the early childhood space, they also have our declining rural districts that have more physical space themselves. And so on rough balance, it works out, but it's clear that, that the purpose here is not to replace or eliminate or compete with nonprofit and independent providers of the childhood. It's to support their work as well as the district work, and we anticipate that partnership has been good in the past and will stay that way. Really, really important point. Thank you for raising it. Other uh, question now, maybe one more, and I'll wrap up. Or not. Um, well, I was, I was saying congratulations. You've, you've passed the test because my staff and I, we've spent the last two years on this, and we find you can only do school finance about 60 minutes at a time, and you have to like, go outside and run around and clear your head, or, because you can't, your, your brain just freezes after about 60 minutes. So you made it 64 minutes through, which is an expert performance for your first attempt. Um, so I just want to say thank you so much for, for having me. Thank you for coming out. I'm so delighted at how many people there are here who are engaged in this. I do think this is a once in a generation chance for us to make a dramatic change to the outcomes we'll get out of our system and to build a system where not just you as parents or, um, or teachers or educators will feel great about the system we built, but where our communities, our businesses, our higher institutions will see that what we're preparing are really amazing young citizens of the world who have the skills they need to not just help our communities survive, but really thrive. So that's, that's the, the big uh, investment we want to make here, and we think we have a chance to do it. And so I uh, would love for you to be involved, stay involved if you want to. Uh, visit the Great Ed website. Uh, you can come to our website, mikejohnson.org, or email me directly. We will be back again uh, to talk more once the ballot titles are selected, so we'll be back through. I want to give you that update first. I want to say another uh, huge thank you to Representative Young. Uh, you were very, very well represented with an education expert in the Capitol who was a huge help uh, on this very tough issue for us in the House, much tougher in the House than it was for us. And so he fought some great battles for us on this one and like many other education issues. So, so thankful to him and to Rennell, of course, who's been an amazing a statewide leader and has helped us craft so many parts of this proposal. Really thankful to, to both of you. So thank you so much for having me.